Okay. Um, good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as you can see, this webinar is being recorded. Um, just click this. Um, my name is Melissa Evanago. I manage the Bureau of Mobile Sources here at DEP. I'm super excited uh, to launch New Jersey's electric school bus program today. Um, this is the first 15 million as part of the electric school bus law. Um, and electric school bus law is giving us the opportunity to relaunch um, our electric school bus efforts and take a step back um, and reflect on what we had done in the past and what we could do better. Um, we've been funding electric school buses since 2019. A lot has changed since then. We've learned many lessons. And like I said, we're, we're looking to relaunch and go back to the beginning um, and give you the basics. Um, so our series of three webinars will take place over the next three weeks. We're intending to give you all the necessary information and tools that you need to make the decision on transitioning your fleet um, to electric. The solicitation details are now posted on our Electric School Bus webpage. Um, join us next Tuesday, the 6th, where we'll walk through the solicitation. We'll go through the application portal on how to apply, um, and then you'll have the ability to ask questions um, during that webinar. Um, as part of this, uh, solicitation. We're very excited to announce that we have a bi-directional charging pilot as part of this solicitation. Um, so join us for the third webinar where, where we will go into details of that pilot. Um, so you're asking what is a bi-directional uh, charging pilot? So that um, pilot will use technology um, and we'll have the capability of using the bi-directional components on an electric school bus to send power back to a building to elevate uh, to alleviate the peak demands um, that we might see in the summer, you know, hot days. Um, there's some financial incentives to do that. So the third webinar, like I said, will focus and take a deeper dive on what that um, pilot is. We'll explain what the technology is and a little bit more details on that program. So before we get started today, I wanna go through a couple logistics. So everybody will be muted. Um, please hold your questions till the end of the first presentation. Then we'll uh, take some questions and then we'll um, move on to the panel where that will be, you know, the whole panel will be a question and answer session. So in order to ask a question, I ask you to please raise your virtual hand. So if you go to the top of your um, monitor, you'll see the hand um, icon and you just hit raise and then that will let us know that somebody wants to ask a question. If you're having technical difficulties, we found the best way to handle that is to log off, log back on. Um, if you're still having technical difficulties and your speakers aren't working, um, then we ask that you uh, type in your question in the chat and we'll go that way. Um, the recording of this webinar will be posted on our webpage. Um, if you haven't visited our webpage yet, please do. There's a lot of information about the future webinars, about the solicitation document. Um, today's PowerPoints will be posted there. Uh, we have a resource section that will give you lots of links to great resources so you can learn more about electric school buses, infrastructure, and deployment. Um, I think that's about it for the logistics, so let's get started. Um, like I said, I want to give you enough time to answer, um, to ask questions. Okay, so hopefully everybody could see my screen. We can see it. Great, thanks. Um, so yes, this is start of New Jersey's electric school bus grant program. Um, if you download the presentation, if you click on the icon, the logo, uh, that will take you to our electric school bus page, web page. Okay, so it's a pretty simple agenda today. Um, please note that the the email address at the bottom of this slide is where you'll submit questions. Um, and please indicate that um, this is for the Electric School Bus Grant Program in the subject line. We will answer questions and post the answers weekly to the webpage. Um, 
As part of Governor Murphy's climate change goals, we continue to focus on the electrification of electric vehicles, uh, specifically medium and heavy duty vehicles, because the transportation sector makes up 30%, 37% of New Jersey's greenhouse gas inventory. The electric school bus law was signed by Governor Murphy in August of 2022. Um, and this focuses $15 million each year for three years. The law acts as guidance on how we should administer the program. Um, and the intent of the electric school bus program is to allow uh, flexibilities um, for us to collect data, to collaborate with other state agencies as we learn about how the school buses are operating um, and we get feedback from all our project partners. Um, and we also get to evaluate a lot of different technologies like the bi-directional um, pilot that we have as part of this solicitation. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll have um, our first invited guest um, to share his screen. Okay, good, I could see yours. So, like I said, I'm very excited. Um, we have an awesome panel today of um, invited guests that have lots of um, knowledge and experience in this space. Um, so first I want to introduce Philip. Philip Burgoyne Allen is an associate with the Electric School Bus Initiative at the World Resource Institute, where he works with states and other school districts to help uh, to help them transition to electric buses and provide transportation that is better for students, communities, and the environment. Um, prior to joining WRI, Philip conducted policy research, analysis, program management, focusing on transportation and education, uh, writing extensively on school bus transportation. Um, uh, in 2021, uh, he was a I'm sorry, a Clean Energy Leadership Institute fellow. I'm sorry, my monitor is glitching a little. Um, Philip is a native Kentuckian and a graduate of the Ohio State University, and he currently lives in New York City. So I'm gonna pass it along to you, Philip. Great, thanks, Melissa. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who's joining this call. I'm glad we have such a good turnout. Uh, before I get started, I just wanna confirm, are you seeing my slides in presenter mode? Yes. Wonderful. So hi everyone, uh, as Melissa said, I'm Philip Burgoyne Allen. I work on the Electric School Bus Initiative at the World Resources Institute or WRI. Uh, so today I'm gonna to give some background information on why we are encouraging school districts to go after adopting electric school buses, uh, some of the benefits, some of the challenges, and some of the lessons learned we've seen from successful electric school bus deployments. So first, I'll just tell you a little bit about WRI. We are a global research organization. We have over 1,400 experts working across 60 countries. Uh, that includes a good-sized team that's focused on electric school buses. So that's us on the Electric School Bus Initiative. Uh, we're, we're working on um, you know, helping school districts adopt electric school buses across the US. Uh, so here, I'll tell you a little bit more about our initiative. Our aim is to partner with a wide array of stakeholders that includes communities, school districts, industry experts, manufacturers, utilities, policymakers, and a host of other folks who have come into our orbit uh, to, to work on transforming and electrifying the school bus market. Together, we want to build unstoppable momentum to electrify the 480,000 school buses in the U.S. by 2030. Obviously, that is a very aggressive goal, uh, given that it's already uh, February 1st of 2024, but we are doing our best to, to create that momentum so that you know, even beyond 2030, districts will continue to have the funding and tools they need to electrify their school bus fleets. Uh, and then lastly, we want to ensure that the transition to electric school buses is equitable. Uh, so focusing funding, focusing our technical assistance on underserved communities. So we go about our work in a variety of ways. Uh, WRI is more than anything else a research institution. So we do a lot of policy research, to try and you know put out a body of evidence that policymakers and others can use to inform decisions that they need to make uh, about you know a, a variety of different topics uh, related to the environment, so forests, oceans, 
land use, transportation, cities, um, a lot of different topics that we cover. Uh, but on the electric school bus initiative, you know, we do do that research trying to, to build a, um, a body of evidence on why we think adopting electric school buses is the right move for school districts across the country. Uh, but we also do a lot of you know, convening different stakeholders, providing free technical assistance to school districts, and really trying to be a flexible initiative that can meet the needs of whatever the current moment is related to electric school buses. Uh, so I look forward to telling you a bit more about what we've learned so far in our work. But before that, I do want to give a brief thank you to our partners in New Jersey who we have worked with over the past couple of years as part of our initiative. So these folks listed here, Doug O'Malley, the Director of Environment New Jersey, Anjali Ramos, the Chapter Director of the Sierra Club uh, New Jersey Chapter, and Bill Barron, the Transportation Chair for Sierra Club's New Jersey Chapter, and Ben Haygood, the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Isles, based in Trenton. These have been a great group of folks who have helped us uh, you know, ad advocate for school electric school buses in New Jersey, and uh, you know, I think they played an instrumental role in helping uh, support this funding program that uh, DEP is is starting to roll out today. So um, again, thank you to these folks who, you know, we're a national organization and they they're specifically focused on New Jersey. So they've been a, a great voice for us uh, to to work with and learn from uh, as we've tried to uh, advance electric school buses in the state. So first, I want to talk about why we think electrifying school buses is the way to go. So you know, Melissa mentioned that. This can help accelerate decarbonization uh, and reduce emissions from the transportation sector, which is one key element. Uh, you know, for some, that's the primary motivation for electrifying school buses. But there are a lot of other benefits too that can really help support you know students and communities and school districts across the country. So, uh, improved health and cognitive outcomes for children. A lot of that is related to the lack of air pollution beyond just carbon emissions. Uh, that children are, you know, the children are exposed to when riding a diesel bus, but are not exposed to when traveling on an electric school bus. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence on the effects of diesel exhaust, which I'll cover more in, in a couple slides from now. Uh, but that's obviously one of the largest benefits. Similarly, there's cleaner air when you switch over from diesel with its tailpipe emissions to electric school buses, which have no tailpipe emissions. Uh, you know, obviously there may still be um, pollution that's created when generating the electricity that charges these buses. But, you know, what we've seen is that the the overall power supply is getting cleaner over time. And we, you know, expect it will continue to be cleaner thanks to efforts like this in New Jersey with electric school buses and a whole host of other efforts at the federal and state and local levels uh, trying to, you know, advance clean energy technology across the country. Uh, there's also reduced operating expenses. Electric school buses, you know, they don't have an internal combustion engine, so there's a lot of parts that don't need to be replaced. There's a lot of fluids that don't need to be replaced. Um, and of course, the, the I guess the fuel savings, uh, when you shift away from diesel fuel, which I'm sure many of you here on the call know, can vary quite a bit. It can go up a lot. It can, you know, go up and down. It can be unpredictable, uh, and it can be affected by a lot of other events going on in the world. So, um, on the other hand, uh, electricity is the most stable form of energy in terms of price uh, and, and one of the cheapest as well. In fact, by a large margin in many, many places. So, uh, you know, reducing the fuel costs and maintenance costs are another key benefit uh, that can, you know, make electrifying school buses not only good for students and their, their health, but also, you know, hopefully a, a smart choice for districts who are obviously mindful of their budgets. Uh, New jobs in green manufacturing associated with, you know, building these electric school buses, uh, maintaining them, installing the charging infrastructure that goes along with them. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for growing these green jobs in the U.S. Uh, and then a couple more points here. We see this, we see electric school buses as a potential tipping point for medium and heavy duty electrification. Uh, you know, there's buses, transit buses, trucks. All sorts of uh, of larger vehicles that that fall under medium and heavy duty. Uh, a lot of times, these are fleet vehicles that are going to be having a lot of miles put on them, and so, you know, it, it's in many ways a great place to start because, uh, you know, if you're able to elect electrify an entire fleet, you can have a, a large impact on these operations. Uh, they lend themselves to scaling these efforts to electrifying whole fleets, what rather than one, you know, one person's car at a time. So, so we see it as an important role 
in electrifying medium and duty heavy fleets. Uh, and then lastly, enhanced resiliency and integration with renewable energy. So this is something Melissa mentioned as well. I know this funding program in New Jersey will have a vehicle to building component with bi-directional charging. So, you know, having an electric school bus is great, but if you compare it with solar panels, if you compare it with battery storage, uh, maybe you have a bi-directional charger at a school building. So in the case of an emergency, you can actually use your electric school bus. It's a giant rolling battery. So, you know, if there's a large powder, power outage for an extended period of time, you can use that bus battery to help charge, you know, a gymnasium or a cafeteria or some other emergency emergency shelter. So, uh, you know, some of that is still in the early stages, but there are examples across the country of districts who are exploring that bi-directional technology as well to further maximize the benefits you get out of these buses. You know, we, we see them as an asset that can do a lot more than just transport students to and from school. Obviously, that's the primary goal of, of the school bus and of school transportation services in general. But uh, there, there's a lot of other interesting and exciting things that these buses can bring to the table. So we'll hear more about that in our panel discussion as well, I believe. Uh, I mentioned diesel exhaust and you know reducing students' exposure to that is one of the key drivers of why we think districts across the country should electrify their school buses. Uh, diesel exhaust has been linked to a number of negative health effects, uh, asthma, cancer, other respiratory respiratory illnesses. It's a known carcinogen, which means it can cause cancer and other diseases. Uh, there are documented negative impacts on both student health and academic performance uh, you know, that, that are correlated to higher exposure to diesel exhaust. So again, you know, if districts are out there looking for ways to improve student health, improve student safety, and even improve students' performance in school, reducing their their exposure to diesel exhaust can uh, play an important role in, in helping do that and create an overall safer and healthier environment for students. Uh, and then, you know, lastly here at the bottom, the exposure to air pollution from school buses had positive and significant effects on some test scores. Uh, so there are some interesting studies out there that show, you know, again, it's pretty straightforward, but if you reduce students' exposure to air pollution on their trip to school every day, that that has longer term effects that can even improve their test scores in some cases. So again, um, you know, anyone who works in school districts knows that improving test scores is always top of mind year to year. Uh, and so we see this as, you know, a broad based benefit beyond just taking kids to and from school. Uh, we also know that the harms from diesel exhaust are not equitably distributed. So, you know, a higher share of low income students take the bus and rely on yellow bus service compared to non low income students. Uh, fine particulate matter, which is a key, you know, a key form of pollution from diesel school buses and uh, other internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, that fine PM exposure from on road sources can be substantially higher for non white students. So, here, 75% higher for Latino students, 73% higher for Asian American students, and 61% higher for African American students. So again, you know, these the the distribution of these negative health effects are are not equitable. And, and that's one reason why we're so focused on equity across our initiative. Uh, again, here, Native American children are, are one and a half times more likely to have asthma than non-Hispanic white children. So again, if, if we're talking about students who are disproportionately exposed to air pollution, disproportionately exposed to areas that are highly industrialized. You know, they might have a depot there. They might have uh, a waste management facility in their community, uh, all sorts of, of, you know, industrial facilities that can create a lot of noise pollution, air pollution, uh, and all sorts of other negative effects, right? We, we know that those are gonna disproportionately impact disadvantaged communities. So we're, we're particularly mindful of the importance of equity as we switch over to electric school buses. So I'll also tell you a little bit about the current state of electric school bus adoption. So as of September 2023, uh, we have a great data set. It's, it's linked in these slides here, which I know will be shared after the fact. And I have a lot of helpful resources throughout that um, I'm excited for folks here to have in their hands. But as of September 23, uh, which as I'm, you know, we're tracking uh, the adoption of electric school buses across the country. We have a great data dashboard that we update uh, as re you know, on a quarterly basis or as regularly as we can. So I know September is not the is not current day, but but it's as updated as as we're able to have it at the moment. But there's a, more than six thousand electric school buses currently committed. So that means you know districts have expressed a commitment to adopting a certain number of electric buses 
maybe they've been awarded funding, maybe they've already procured them, had them delivered or currently operating them. So that's kind of the broadest bucket is what we call committed school buses. So there's over 6,000 uh, in the US today based on our data. It's nearly 1,000 districts and private fleet operators. The majority of these buses are in school districts with the highest shares of low-income households. Uh, and these committed buses span 49 states, Washington, D.C., several territories, and tribal nations as well. Uh, on the right side of the slide here, you'll see that they're operating not just in big cities or, or suburban areas, though those do have the highest shares of these buses, but we're also seeing them in, in towns and rural areas uh, and again, I think we have a great diversity perspective on our panel uh, and they'll be able to speak to operating these types of buses in, in all sorts of different um, different areas. So excited for that. Uh, as I mentioned, they're operating across urban, rural and suburban communities uh, across 49 states. But on this slide, I mostly wanted to point out the bottom right box here about the leading states for commitments. So California, Maryland and New York uh, are you know, at the top of the list right now in terms of having these electric school buses committed uh, across their districts. So now uh, I'll talk a little bit about New Jersey specifically. So uh, based on our data in New Jersey, there are a little over 200 total committed electric school buses. Uh, most of those uh, have been awarded funding, so they're probably, you know, in the midst of procurement right now, but there are total of 21 that have been ordered or are delivered or operating. So again, you know, uh, as Melissa mentioned, kind of re relaunching DEP and New Jersey's focus on electri electrifying school buses. We think that's great. We think this funding program will be a huge asset in that, um, in, you know, in that goal. So looking forward to seeing this number go from 21, uh, you know, getting all the way up to that 200 that are committed and even beyond that as more and more districts look to electrify their school buses. Uh, a little under 500 students are currently riding electric school buses in New Jersey, and this is the most recent data here, the 44 ESBs, electric school buses, that have been funded by EPA's Clean School Bus Program. So for those on the call who have been following the electrification of school buses for some time now, uh, you're hopefully aware of EPA's Clean School Bus Program. That's a $5 billion program over five years uh, funded under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law that is awarding rebates and grants to help school districts have the funding they need to take on the higher upfront costs that come along with electric school buses. So there, there are 44 so far that have been funded federally in New Jersey. Uh, here's just a little more detail on the CSBP awardees in the state. Uh, Lakewood Township ha has been awarded the most buses with 14. Bridgeton City has the least with two so far. Uh, but in total, these six districts have uh, garner nearly $20 million in federal awards to help them take on the additional costs of adopting electric school buses. But, uh, you know, despite this momentum we've seen of, of more and more districts looking at electric buses, more and more contractors and manufacturers and, and all sorts of folks having a keener interest in electrifying school buses, there are also challenges that districts will need to overcome. So we don't want to minimize that. Um, funding gaps, that's one of the key ones. Obviously, you know, an electric school bus is substantially more expensive than a diesel school bus. A uh, diesel school bus is, you know, roughly in the range of maybe 110,000, 125,000. Some of it depends on the specs and the time, you know, the prices go up and down. So it depends on when you're buying it. But uh, an electric school bus is, you know, three times, maybe even a little more than three times more expensive than a diesel school bus. So uh, we anticipate that those prices are going to come down over time, uh, especially, you know, the, the biggest driver of those costs are the batteries. And we know that that year after year battery costs, uh, you know, stay flat and come down. So we anticipate that as the technology improves, uh, as the pricing improves, that these buses are going to be even more competitive with diesel buses on a pricing front. Uh, but when you count in programs like this one from New Jersey or the, or the federal clean school bus program, right? If you, if you have that chunk of funding to help offset those upfront costs, you can actually get very competitive on the total cost of ownership when you when you account for not just that upfront price difference, but also the fuel and maintenance savings you're going to see over the life of the bus. So that's why we're so excited about these funding programs, which can really make this a possibility for school districts, especially those that have been historically underserved. Uh, but here I do note it's funding gaps as well. So 
we've heard districts, you know, even if you get a, a, an award from your from a state government or from the federal government or some other source, you know, it might cover 90 percent or 95 percent of the cost. But even just coming up with that five or 10 percent can be a challenge for, for school districts. So, um, you know, that that's something that I'll talk more about on recommendations for that. But, uh, the, you know, our mentality is and I, and I note this here at the bottom that if you're proactive in your planning, you can mitigate a lot of these challenges and find ways to overcome them without, you know, be, being um, caught in a situation where you, you the numbers don't work out for you. So we're, we're trying to get people to start early uh and, and be actively planning for and discussing electric school buses so that they can you know have all their have all their ducks in a row uh as, as they pursue these buses another challenge we hear a lot about is limited staff capacity um you know this varies across districts but sometimes it's it's a an enterprising transportation director who really wants to bring electric school buses to their district but you know they're covering routes they're managing their they're they're managing their existing operations already uh, on a on a limited budget, so to then add electric school buses to that can be a challenge, especially when you need folks who can apply for grants and apply for funding programs. So we like to see um, these types of programs be as accessible as possible because we know it can be challenging for transportation staff to not only you know manage their day to day work, but also take on new technology, new charging infrastructure, uh, which takes me to my next challenge: charging infrastructure. You know, school districts are primarily operating diesel and gasoline vehicles. And so when it comes to things like putting in charging infrastructure, knowing your utility rate, understanding how to minimize your electricity costs, right? That That's all new information for a lot of transportation departments. But what we've seen across the country and what you'll hear on the panel today that um, districts are doing that successfully. So, you know, there is a learning curve, but but we're seeing many districts take that on and do it well and really know their stuff. Uh, and have become leaders leaders in the sector on on how to be innovative with charging infrastructure. So um, again, the earlier you start planning for those things, the less of a challenge it's going to be as you need to navigate uh, different challenges you might you might encounter. Uh, project delays. I'm sure folks have maybe heard about this. Sometimes you order an electric school bus and you're you know it's supposed to be coming in eight months and then it's twelve months and then it's fifteen months or maybe you need. Uh, you need a new transformer for your site to help, you know, to bring more, you know, enable you to charge your buses at, at a particular depot. Um, coming out of the, the COVID pandemic, right, there have been a lot of supply chain issues, but we're seeing those increasingly get sorted out. We're, we're seeing manufacturers uh, increasing their production capacity on electric school buses and opening new factories and expanding factories so that they can, uh, you know, bring these buses to the road on, on, a, on a faster pace. So again, you know, project delays are something that are unavoidable, even with, you know, diesel or propane buses, any any long term project, right? You're, you might have construction delays, you might have issues uh, uh, supplying certain equipment. Uh, but again, if you tackle it early in the process, then, then you're that much better prepared when inevitably you might face some sort of delay and you, you can be nimble and, and work around that. Lastly, another challenge we see is district wide alignment. So. You know, there, there are a lot of different departments operating in school districts, right? So I'm sure many of you here today are from transportation departments, but there's also procurement and financing and, you know, not to mention the superintendent and the school board. So, you know, we, we've seen some superintendents who might be really interested in electric school buses, but aren't quite communicating with their transportation departments about, you know, the operational realities of, of what's needed to make that possible. Uh, and vice versa, you know, there, there are transportation directors who are really interested in this, but but it can be a challenge to get their school board on board with, with moving forward on applying for funding programs. Um, you know, it, the people who are maybe writing your grant applications need to be talking to the people who will procure the buses and they need to talk to the people who will operate the buses. Uh, and the people who operate the buses need to talk to the facilities folks who, you know, are the ones paying the utility bill and managing construction projects. So. There's a lot of coordination that needs to happen, but again, um, if you if you start early, these are all things that you can you can take on and handle them in a way that's as manageable as possible for the district. Um, I also want to share some lessons learned based on our work across the country with school districts who have had successful ESB deployments. Again, you're going to hear from three of these folks on the panel after my presentation, and I can attest that they are you know, superstars in the ESB space. So I'm excited for you all to hear from them about 
you know, district folks who are doing this, but besides myself on the research side, these folks are really, you know, putting vehicles on the road and operating them day to day. So excited to to hear them speak after myself. But um, some of the, the key lessons we've seen here, one, designating a project manager. Again, this transition requires a lot of coordination. And so having one person whose job it is to make sure that those things are all moving forward uh, can really just do a lot to help you manage a project uh, and keep everything on track. Similarly, coordinating with district leadership and across district departments, as I just said, you know, there's transportation, there's facilities, there's financing, there's uh, there's the school board. There's all sorts of folks who who may be need, may need to be involved, uh, and that's within the school district. But then also, you'll need to engage with your electric utility, other local partners. Maybe there are local nonprofits who who can assist you or, or help guide your community engagement. Uh, maybe there are local foundations who are interested in funding school buses or, or otherwise helping district, you know, make it possible for districts to adopt these buses. So again, a lot of this comes down to coordination and having a plan in place and, and making sure all the relevant stakeholders are coming to the table to make sure districts can be successful with uh, successful with the adoption of electric buses. Uh, another another lesson learned here is to to really pr center equity in this work. So I you know I've mentioned a few different times about some of the disparities we see in exposure to air pollution uh, and you know just again disadvantaged communities being the last to get the newest technology, right? That's so often the case. And if we're not mindful about it, it can also be the case for electric school buses. So, you know, as you're figuring out which routes to electrify, who's gonna get the buses, where to put them, who they're gonna serve, um, being mindful of equity in your community engagement and your deployment of these buses should be top of mind. Uh, prioritizing planning for charging infrastructure, Again, super important, you know, the bus isn't going to go anywhere without charging infrastructure. So um, a lot of school districts, you know, they get the funding for the bus and then they start figuring out the charging charging infrastructure after that. Uh, ideally, you know, I know that's the reality of how some of these funding programs work where you can't buy the bus until you have the funding, but it doesn't mean you can't start thinking about a broader strategy for electrification, you know, is there, is it something you just want to pilot? Do you maybe want to electrify half your fleet or your entire fleet over a certain amount of time? Uh, what does that mean for your depot sites? What does that mean for who you're going to need to bring in for construction or, you know, coordinating, 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 excuse me, with your utility? So again, uh, that should be a top priority is not just thinking about the bus itself, but also starting to have a plan in place for the charging infrastructure. Uh, Planning for staff training and workforce development. Again, you know, this is a new technology. It, it's in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the school buses folks are already operating, but you will need to, you know, change some of the way you train your drivers. You'll need to uh, maybe seek out training for your maintenance staff who are going to be working on some of the same parts as, an, as a diesel bus, but many, um, many fewer parts, but some different parts as well. And obviously the battery and high voltage system that that's new on an electric bus so you may need to uh change the way you train your maintenance staff you may need to coordinate with first responders who you know maybe they're used to responding to an incident involving an internal combustion engine vehicle and now they need to be mindful of some of the differences when you're responding to uh, a situation with an electric vehicle involved so again you know the broader the set of stakeholders you bring to the table the better um and even beyond that with workforce development right uh, a lot of people are interested in how do I make sure that I have access to the services I need? You know, maybe that's training my own maintenance staff. Maybe there's external help I need to get from my vehicle dealer, from the manufacturer. Um, you know, who are the technicians going to be that that man that maintain my chargers, maintain my buses, that help me install all these things? So we're we're seeing a lot of momentum there around you know, training programs within districts, partnering with local community colleges, all, all sorts of things on the workforce development side, but being mindful of that as you start planning for electric school buses is a key factor. Um, negotiating training and maintenance requirements during procurement, you know, similarly to other things I've mentioned, just starting early is always our, our top recommendation, but um, when you're procuring chargers and buses, you know, you, you'll be entitled to some level of training from the manufacturers or from the dealers. Um, and of course, if these things are under a warranty or have some sort of maintenance package, 
that comes along with them, right? That'll have certain requirements too. So doing your due diligence before you sign that contract to make sure that, you know, what you need in terms of training for your staff or maintenance for your equipment is included in the contract you ultimately sign with some of these vendors. Uh, that can go a long way to preventing headaches, right? Where maybe you thought you were going to get something that doesn't quite materialize, but if you 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 know if you have a robust RFP or a robust contract, then you can really um, help reduce some of those challenges. Uh, and the last two here, I'll cover you know somewhat quickly, but building relationships with other school districts. There's a lot of peer learning we're seeing happening. Uh, some of the districts who will be on the panel today, right? They've they've met each other before. They they've swapped best practices. They've shared challenges with other districts. Um, just to just you know to take all the learning that's happening in each individual district and try to bring that to a more national or or even just a regional level. Um, but also in the long term, if you you know if you're gonna, I guess a lot of districts right now, you know they're they're still going to be relying on diesel or gasoline vehicles for things like field trips, athletic um, athletic events. But in the long term, as more and more of these buses become electric, which is a trend we expect to continue, you know, you're, you're going to need to charge at another school district if you have a sporting event there or charge at a museum or some other facility if you have a field trip, right? So the more you start to build these relationships, the more, you know, different districts will be able to step in and help each other um, navigate some of the challenges and enable more and more electrification of longer routes and, and things of that nature. So building those relationships is key. Um, and then lastly, you know, aggressively pursuing funding opportunities. The reason we're here today is for this funding opportunity that New Jersey is rolling out. I, I mentioned the federal uh, clean school bus program as well. Some folks might have incentive opportunities from their utilities or from air quality districts or all sorts of entities that that may be able to have funding available that can support uh, procuring buses, procuring charging infrastructure and, and maintaining all of this equipment. So my recommendation is to be aggressive in pursuing these opportunities. You know, you don't have to you don't have to wait around to hear if you win one to apply for another. The more irons you have in the fire, the better your chances of success. Um, and I think you'll hear from our panelists today that uh, they're they're going for it. They're going after funding. And so, you know, if you all sit by and don't apply, they'll be happy to have better chances at winning. So, you know, I encourage folks to go after these funding opportunities and try to get your slice of, of the funding that's available because, you know, like the federal program, it's a five year program. We're hoping it will continue after that in some form. But, uh, you know, the early movers get a chunk of that funding. So I, I recommend uh, folks really pay attention to that and, and pursue these funding opportunities. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as I've said a dozen times now that, that right, if you're proactive, if you're comprehensive, you start early, you're going to have a more successful deployment. So uh, just keep that in mind. I specifically want to mention charging infrastructure. I know that this is one of the biggest challenges we hear just from school districts in our work. You know, they, it's it's often a new area of expertise for them, and, and there's a lot of complex stuff happening, a lot of new vendors coming to the market, um, and a lot of different you know, different vendors that need to work together, you know, whether it's your bus, your charger, some level of software that, that's layered on top of your charger to, to help minimize your electricity costs. Um, and so it can be a lot for, you know, one transportation director or one superintendent to tackle on their own. So we're trying to really focus on charging infrastructure and make sure that we have resources available to help. So I want to just go through some of the um, some of the, the key things we hear about there. Uh, I'll try to move. I don't want to go too far over time, so I'll try to move through this at a faster pace here. But um, well, first, engage your electric utility. They might have a make ready program that can that can provide funding to help get your site ready on the utility side of the meter. You know, if you need a new transformer, you need to bring more power to the site. Um, they can help you navigate what upgrades might be needed. And for some, you might not need any upgrades. You might be able to do this with your existing capacity on your site. So. Um, you know, engage with your electric utility. They also might have fleet advisory services where, you know, they similar to what we're doing, providing free technical assistance. They might have programs available that, that do a, provide a similar function. They might have incentives that can help reduce your costs of buying these vehicles and chargers as well. Um, centering equity and deployment. You know, as I mentioned, your depot location, is it, it you know, do you have a depot that's in a, a, a disadvantaged community? Maybe that has a lot of other industrialization around as well. That can be a great place to start with electrification because you're you're going to be you know doing the most good for those with the most need which is something we always want to highlight in our equity discussions 
Um, and then, you know, route selection, where where are you deploying these buses? What communities are they serving? Are the students who have the most exposure to negative air quality going to have the most exposure to electric school buses once you deploy them? That's that's what we'd like to see. Uh, consider your operational constraints. There, there's depots, you know, there might be space constraints in your depot about where you can park buses, where you can put chargers, the dwell time, you know, that's going to affect uh, how long you're able to charge your buses, if you need midday charging, how long your routes are, what sort of terrain and weather conditions you have. So understanding your operational constraints and what that can mean for electric buses can just help you make the right decisions about um, how, how to how to navigate that. You know, we see electric school buses handling all sorts of routes, all sorts of, of conditions, all sorts of um, terrain. So, you know, it is possible. We know districts are doing it. Uh, we're happy to connect you with them if, if you reach out. Uh, but again, you know, being on top of these these operational constraints can help make sure that you are um, doing this in a way that's going to be feasible for you operationally. Uh, be mindful of your, your utility rates. Charging overnight, uh, you know, it, it might it's likely going to be the most co cost effective option because you're avoiding peak demand for power. You know, if you're charging in the middle of the day uh, for midday charging, it might be more expensive to charge at that time because your energy cost might be higher. But depending on your operations, you know, you might have a long route where you require midday charging and you, you can't service that route with an electric bus without midday charging. A lot of times that's not the case. But again, you know, if you understand your utility rates and your operations, you can make the right choices about how to um, how to charge your buses in a way that meets your needs and also reduces your energy costs, because that's one of the big benefits of electric buses. Uh, right sizing your bus battery and charger. Uh, this can this can help again mitigate a lot of the concerns about route length or you know is my bus going to make it back is it going to have enough charge right so a lot of people want to go straight to fast charging if they have concerns about range but that's not your only option you can have you can mitigate a lot of issues with range just by having a larger battery capacity right so then that's a one-time cost where when you're procuring maybe you increase the size of the battery that you're getting with your bus and that can help make sure that you're you know you can you can make your routes every day um, and again, you know, when it comes to charging power, uh, you, you want to have a balance. So, you know, maybe you can get by with, a, with level two charging, uh, it's cheaper, it's simpler, but it does take more time. So if you're charging primarily overnight, then, you know, uh, a level two charger is going to be able to, to, to meet your needs. Uh, if you need midday charging, or, or maybe you just want to have the option of fast charging in addition to level two, because you want to, you know, not be anxious that your bus is going to make it back then you can look at the dc fast chargers they're more expensive they're more complex to maintain but they do charge quickly and that's you know that's the whole premise so um i think having this in mind and having everything in balance again can help you make the right decisions uh and thinking long term uh we, you know if you're planning to electrify your depot you don't want to just stick a charger in the ground and then start running your bus right you you want to have a holistic plan so that you're limiting how much you have to dig and do underground construction. Maybe you want, maybe you lease your depot and you don't own it. So you want to be able to move your infrastructure from place to place if, if for some reason you change your depot location, right? So maybe you want to have above ground infrastructure where your charger is on, you know, a cement pad or attached to a Jersey barrier or some other, some other way of keeping things above ground so that if the time comes, you can move it's particularly important for contractors who, you know, they may have a contract for now and want to invest in charging infrastructure, but maybe in the long term they'll be, they'll be uh, operating somewhere else. So for school districts and contractors, you know, it's important to think long term about what you want to have at your site. So we, we have a lot of resources to help folks answer those questions. Um, I think I'm getting close on time, so I, I, I think I have a few minutes here left, but um, I quickly just want to mention battery charger and dwell time relationships. Again, this is something we hear, you know, we hear a lot from school districts. So uh, on this chart, basically on the far left, you've, you've got some different manufacturers. Uh, the, the battery size column there, uh, second from the left, you'll see, you know, the, the first number is the nameplate. Cure the bus, it has, you know, for this first one, 155 kilowatt hours. But you, you know, you don't want to be taking your bus to zero all the time, right? You want to make sure that you um, have sufficient charge to get back and just to maintain the state of health of your battery. You don't want to be taking it to zero all the time. So this is what we call the usable uh, battery capacity, which, you know, roughly we say 80 percent 
is, is kind of what we look at as the the wiggle room you want to have. Um, and then similarly on the Chargers, you'll see some numbers in parentheses there. Uh, these are these are the three most common chargers that we see. The 19.2 kilowatt AC charger, that's like your standard level two charger. Uh, on the far right side, you have the 60 kilowatt fast charger. That's like your, your typical DC fast charger. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing more of this middle option too, this 25 kilowatt DC charger. Sometimes people call it a wall box. Um, you know, that's a lower power DC charger. So not quite a fast charger, but faster than uh, your, your standard AC slash level two charger. Um, so again, you know, we we assume, you know, th those are again, nameplate charger charger power levels there, the 19.2, 25 and 60. Uh, but you're going to have some loss of efficiency, right, just from the electricity going from the charger to the bus. So here we assume 95% is considered usable. Um, you know, if it's really, really hot or really, really cold, that might vary. So, you, you know, be mindful again of those those weather conditions and other operational factors. But here, this is just to give you a sense of how long it takes to charge a bus, right? So this program is only for type C and D buses is my understanding. So I've pulled some here. Um, basically, you take the number in parentheses for the battery size, that's kilowatt hours. You divide it by the charger power, that's kilowatts, and you're left with hours. So, you know, if you have a low power charger charging a big battery, you know, you see with the IC bus type C there, that's 9.2 hours to charge. That's not feasible for midday charging. You're going to need to charge that overnight. But on the far end with the 60 kilowatt, bu 60 kilowatt DC fast charger, you can charge that IC type C bus in under three hours, right? Or even faster for some of the other, the other buses listed here. So maybe if you need to charge up but midday between your morning route and your afternoon route, then DC fast charging can really make that possible. Whereas with a slower level two charge, it's it's going to take too long to be even worthwhile to do that. So again, you know, different power levels charge faster, have different costs, and we just recommend that you're really thoughtful about how to do this. Um, one thing on the Thomas type C there at the bottom, you'll see NA for the 19.2 kilowatt AC charger. Uh, that Thomas, you know, they, it doesn't have a, it doesn't accept AC charging. It only does DC. So that that's a unique element of, of Thomas built buses on the electric side. So again, if you're if your dealer is a Thomas dealer and you like having Thomas buses in your fleet, then you know you might want to look at some of these lower power DC chargers and and mix that with a fast charger uh, because you're not going to be able to just have a level two. So um, you know I don't want to dwell on that. Well, I guess it is about dwell time, so not to dwell on it too long. But uh, just being mindful of the different operational factors can really help you have a good plan in place. Um, I apologize if I'm running a bit over here, but uh, I'm near the end, so I'll, I'll run through these pretty quick. We've got a bunch of resources on our website. Uh, there are some here from other folks, the Sierra Club and Charge EBC that are specific to New Jersey, but we have a lot of awesome resources that help with all sorts of things, planning and deployment, funding, procurement, equity, and this is just the list I was able to fit on the slide, so we have even more than this but really encourage you to check out our website, reach out if you have questions. We have a lot of helpful stuff that can help across a wide range of problems or challenges you might be trying to overcome or plan for as you get ready to adopt electric buses. Uh, again, really recommend you engage with us. We have weekly office hours where you can get one-on-one -on -one support from our staff. We also have email updates where you can get a, you know, a monthly email from our team that just is giving you the most important news on, on funding programs opening, webinars that are that are coming up, new resources we've launched that might be helpful for you. So I really encourage folks to engage with the Electric School Bus Initiative, uh, even beyond this webinar, and you'll have all these links in the slides that Melissa will send around and, and post online after the fact. So the last thing I want to mention here, just a plug for the, the, the current round of Clean School Bus Program rebates from EPA. Uh, they were supposed to close January 31st. They That deadline has been extended to February 14th. So you've got two more weeks. Uh, you know, apply for the federal one, apply for this New Jersey program, apply for all the programs you can, because once you have that money coming in, it's going to help like really increase the momentum you have for electrifying your fleets. So I just wanted to take a moment to plug here the, the clean school bus program rebates that are open right now. That deadline has been extended. So we have a bunch of stuff on our website about the, the clean, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, about the clean school bus program. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't already. Uh, and just wanted to make folks aware that it, it's not that hard of an application. You can get it in in two weeks. It's it's definitely doable. You can get it in a few days if you have to. So really recommend folks check that out. 
Um, so I'll stop there. I think I went over a bit, but hopefully we'll have some, maybe I can answer some questions and then we'll kick it over to the panel. Thanks, Philip. Um, a lot of information for people to digest. Um, like I said, we're going to share this webinar on our website as well as the PowerPoint. Um, so our website is stopthesoot.org. Um, and then if you go to the active solicitations, um, you'll find the electric school bus page. I'll also put that link in the chat for you to follow. Um, but at this time, do we have any questions for Philip before we get to um, our panel? I see here. Uh, there's a lot on. of. Oh no, yeah, there's sorry. a lot of questions in the chat, aren't there? Yep. I just wanted to, you know, see if there was any. I'm, I'm trying to go through them on the chat, but since I don't see any hands raised, um, I see that there was a question about a 24 passenger um, vehicle and if this opportunity um, would allow for 24 passenger buses. Uh, so this solicitation is for Type C and D buses. Um, we do have other funding that is available for um, the smaller buses, and that's through our Reggie program. And again, if you go to our website of stopthesoot.org under active solicitations, you'll see the other opportunities for funding. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about the specifics of the solicitation. That document is online, um, but please hold your questions for next week where we go, you know, through the whole solicitation and we'll answer all of your questions now. Um, I want to use this space uh, for people to ask questions to our experts who are working in the space, who are um, who own the buses. Um, so that's what I want to focus the questions on for this webinar. Um, so I gave you the website. I will put it on the in the link. Uh, the application portal opens on February 6th and then it closes on May 17th. And yeah, I see a lot of activity in the chat, so I can definitely, you know, I, I think maybe we want to shift over to the panel, but I will definitely read over these and respond to folks in the chat uh, while that's going on. So I'll try to get as many answers out there uh, as possible, but I did drop a survey link here. I know folks get surveyed to death. But we just want it's very brief, as brief as possible. We just want to make sure that when we're doing these presentations and working with school districts that we're actually helping uh, helping answer your questions and helping you learn more about this. So if you can do me a favor and just take three minutes to do that survey for me, that'd be super helpful. But uh, yeah, I will I'll keep my Q and A answers to the chat here and and make sure I get folks answers. Thanks, Philip. Um, and I also see that Mara uh, from DEP put the link. Uh, to the web page. So thank you, Mara. So let's move to our next um, part of the meeting, which is our expert panel. We have three great representatives here. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce them each, but just as an overview, uh, we have Matt Berlin, uh, Kean Fields, and Tim Forker. I'll go through each of them and then I'll allow them to introduce themselves and to um, give you some background on, you know, the type of projects and their experience. So I'll start with Matt. So Matt Berlin um, is the CEO of NYCS Bus, which is a nonprofit, 850 uh, school bus company operation throughout New York City. NYCS Bus has been on the forefront of electrification. So prior to working um, at NYCS Bus, Matt was the founding general manager of New York City's City Bus Program and ran the uh, New York City Public Schools Office of Pupil Transportation. Matt will provide his per, uh, perspective and expertise from his personal business, um, along with the perspective and the knowledge that he has from working uh, for New York City. So Matt, um, I'll let you, if you wanna expand on you know, that, if you wanna give you know, a quick, Summary sure. of your experience with school buses. I'll turn it over to you before we go to the next speaker. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, you know, uh, thank you, Lisa. So, Matt Berlin. So, I run Nice Bus. We're uh, we're a um, school bus company in New York City. We happen to be a nonprofit. Um, we operate about 750 routes. We've got three electric school buses that we're running now, and our experience with them is is really terrific. We have uh, 25 more on order. Uh, we're expecting to get those over the winter or the spring. Uh, and then we just won um, a next round of EPA awards uh, for 100 more coming. And I will say 
Um, one of the, I guess, two things sort of just to emphasize kind of um, what's been said, you know, one of them is kind of planning early is really great uh, and taking advantage of grants. Frankly, it's less competitive now. And so jumping in and applying for grants, the Canes just, you know, I mean, like it's, you know, and, um, you know, the, 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 as we say, as we say here in Brooklyn, the knockers we get from the, from the, the head of the schools, the superintendent, when we win big grants, right, is really great, right? And we often, in school busing, we often don't get um, nice publicity. The other thing I'll just say quickly is, you know, one of the ways we did it was a little bit kind of jump in and do things. You know, we got three buses and frankly, we bought three chargers from Amazon and hung them on the wall and started that way. And that's another, sometimes the planning can be daunting. It's important to plan, but there's also the part where, you know, buying a bus, putting it on a short route, uh, is, you know, that teaches you some stuff. So anyway, I'm happy to talk more. And in case I forget, um, you are all welcome to cross the Hudson River and we'd be happy to show you around what we're doing here in New York. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> so next, let me introduce Kian Fields. Uh, so Kian manages the transition to a zero emissions electric fleet for Boston Public Schools. Um, they have a fleet of 750 school buses. He's fully focused on electrification, including the operations of Boston's 20 existing uh, electric buses and the planning for the future deployment of over 100 electric buses over the next two years. Uh, Kian brings deep technical knowledge about clean transportation and EVs, as well as planning and funding to advance infrastructure projects. Uh, Kian's experience as a consultant, along with his school uh, district experience, can aid all of you um, with your questions. So welcome, um, Kian, and if you have anything else you'd like to add, please do. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm thrilled to be here and, and chat with everybody. Thank you. That was, that was perfect. That was spot on. Um, I'll just, I think I'll say, you know, I'm, so I've been with Boston Public Schools coming up on nine months now, and I'm, um, from that standpoint, like I am new to school transportation, and I'll just say I am, I've been learning so, so much, especially from like Matt and Tim and the World Resources Institute that we have on this call. So um, I'm really excited to share what I've learned and, um, and just talk with, yeah, and hear from folks here. Um, and I'll just say, you know, I grew up in sort of small town Massachusetts and we're Boston is partnering with a lot of like our local um, the Massachusetts towns. And I just that kind of partnership, um, I think, is so valuable. And I just want to make a plug similar to Matt of like reach out in that similar way. Reach out to Boston anytime. Um, shoot me an email. We are really eager to partner and share, share and collaborate. Um, I can give more of the background in Boston later, but I'll pause for now. OK, thank you. Um, so next, let me introduce Tim. Tim Forker is the superintendent of Will, um, sorry, Williams Field Schools in Illinois. Tim has been providing tremendous leadership to the spur on the transition of electric school buses across his state. In 2022, his district was awarded um, a rebate for seven electric school buses as part of EPA's Clean School Bus Program. In 2023, he led um, a group of 20 Illinois school districts and a successful grant application under DOE's Renew America's School Program. And this project will deploy microgrids across the districts, including on-site solar, stationary storage, bi-directional electric school bus batteries. Um, so Tim brings his insight as a school administrator and can share his insight and his thought process and his reason why he decided to transition to electric school buses. So welcome, Tim. Um, and feel free if there's anything you'd like to add before we get started. Yeah, thank you. No, I just um, for all the districts that might be a little bit smaller out there with a little bit of a, a, a smaller fleet operation, that's that's what we navigate here. And we are working to make the transition holistically um, within a, a full microgrid approach so that we build resiliency and um, are able to maximize the, uh, you know, the opportunity that comes with transitioning transitioning from what we refer to as, you know, a yellow school bus is an energy consumer uh, and a, um, a, a electric school bus is more of a, a energy asset. Thank Great. you, Melissa. Thanks. Um, so like I said, this next hour, we're going to spend time um, just taking questions and, you know, having people answer them. So this is your time to think about, you know, what is your 
biggest questions that you need to learn to make that decision to transition to electric school buses. Um, again, uh, to ask a question, please raise your hand. If you go to the top of the monitor, you'll see raise with the little handprint above it. Please do that. Um, I'll call on you. I just want to start with a couple of questions. And then, uh, Joe, you're the first one I see. So um, let me ask a couple of questions and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, so my first question is for Tim. As a school district um, administrator, what, what sparked your interest? What made you decide to look into electric school buses? Um, and then the second part to that is, um, how soon were you able to see any financial benefits from transitioning to electric school buses? Yeah, so our, our journey started with our kids about eight years ago. Um, we had some uh, um, some energy, you know, some uh, uh, in electricity here in our our community uh, for for a period of time, and it led our our students to construct a community microgrid model, uh, and we've moved forward with uh, concepts of that modular using a modular approach based upon when funding is available. Uh, so we now have on-site solar. Um, we were fortunate to win clean school bus rebates in fall of 2022. Uh, we run five daily routes here. Again, we're a small operation, but we're running all uh, we're running electric buses on all daily routes now. Um, and we've got seven electric buses on site. So that means we utilize electric buses for transportation for our um, for our athletic athletic teams and outside events uh, as well. So we've been running all electric routes since November. Uh, we've logged, just to use round numbers, we've logged about 22,000 or 23,000 miles. Uh, it's taken 21,000 kilowatt hours of electricity uh, to run those miles. Uh, so we're getting better numbers than, than we anticipated. We're just burning a little over one kilowatt hour of electricity per mile uh, traveled. And these are winter months. Uh, so I think those are really, really good numbers. Utilizing our approach with the solar array that we have on site uh, means that it's taken $500 to fuel our buses for those 23,000 miles. Uh, using our current diesel prices, it would have cost us $14,000 to fuel in diesel. So right now, we don't anticipate that this will hold, uh, but right now we're experiencing a 96% reduction in fuel costs to run our daily daily bus routes. Those are huge numbers. Um, so since what time? So what's the time period that you see November? That? Yeah, November. November. We we ran a few. You know, we were running a few routes in October, but November first is is really when we had all routes uh, running electric buses. So basically, November part of uh, December. You know, uh, prior to the holiday break, and then and then all of January. Yeah, that's awesome. So all you school district administrators and transportation, you know, directors, I would think that that would, you know, spark your interest. That's a huge uh, fuel savings. Um, I have a question for uh, Kean and then Matt, and then I'll turn it over to Joe. You'll be the first person. Um, so Kean, working with electric school buses in Boston, how are you managing those bus operations in the cold weather? Yeah, great question. And I'll um you know, there are challenges, I think, in the cold weather. The technology, <clears throat> with every new technology, there are pros and cons. And with a battery, like at the way the, the chemical structure, at, when it gets colder, um, it charges slower. And the actual, um, the amount of energy in that battery is, um, you can get sort of less miles out of it. And so how we've been operating and sort of managing around that um, is we set a limit, um, assuming that we set like a max number of miles um, of 40 miles um, and we don't route buses longer than that. Um, that's 40 miles in the morning, 40 miles in the afternoon. Um, and we've just found that there, you have to sort of assume there will be some range loss in the cold, um, whether that's about 50%, um, different manufacturers will be, will be different. Um, and so, um, so I would say that that's sort of the one, one big area. And number two is, um, battery thermal preconditioning, um, which is where you basically, it's like when you walked out to your car on a cold morning and turned on the engine and the defroster before you go out there, we can sort of do the same thing with these school buses. And now um, 
right now it takes a little bit of manual labor still. Um, you have to have somebody go and actually and do that, but um, ensuring we do that preconditioning is critical so that when the bus then pulls out at 5 a.m. on that morning when it's below freezing, it's using it is using much less energy to then warm up the battery. Um, and so um, so battery thermal preconditioning, which is really tech jargony, and I'm sorry, but that process, which literally just means warm up the battery um, before leaving, um, is critical too. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll pause there. And we're, um, I'll actually I'll just make a plug. We started, this is something that we, I make no claims that we have figured out cold weather operations. I think this is, we're going to continue learning and continue refining. Um, and so Boston, with a, a few partners here um, and World Resources Institute, started a cold weather resilience like working group, and we're just trying to connect regularly and talk through like what are what are challenges and what are the best practices here. So um, I'll maybe plug that too, and we'll advertise that later. But um, again, just want to partner with folks and, and figure that out. There there are challenges in the cold weather, but we can we can improve and we can get there. Yeah, thanks, Ken. I think, you know, that's the one thing to think about when we talk about transitioning to any electric vehicles. It, you know, it's very different and we're learning the technology and, you know, we're not here to say that it's all great and there's no issues because there are bumps in the road like anything. Um, but it, you know, ha having the ability to talk with others and learn, um, I think it helps, you know, everybody nationwide, you know, whether you're a school district or you're a school um, bus dealer or manufacturer, you know, the more information we share, the better. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Matt, I have a two-part question for you. Um, so how have you approached the planning of the charging infrastructure? How did you make the decision on, you know, what type of charger or what level of charger to install? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how to have a uh, um, an organized um, answer to that. I guess we did, you know, we got very lucky at Nice Bus with um, with electrification. We, um, or so we're a young company. We bought a existing bus company about two and a half years ago, and we were. Um, I, I so I'm a big uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, um, uh, cheerleader for WRI. Uh, they really are incredibly helpful, and um, they really do. I mean, it's, they're just, they've been terrific. They should have helped us write a grant to our state energy research and development authority, um, which helped us get a head start on electrification. And so some of the way that we started planning was just the exigencies of that grant. We had to start moving. So um, a little bit of it was haphazard, but that might not have been bad, this sort of idea of just kind of starting. So we, um, what we found first were some professionals, right? And in particular, we found a charge management company. Happened without naming them, they've been great. They've provided engineering support, um, uh, really terrific engineering support. The same way a bus dealer really helps you, at least a good one, helps you with much more than just kind of you know taking your order for a bus and dropping it off. Um, they really helped us with the sort of the 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 planning for the charging and helped us think through kind of a three stage process. So the first one was let's get some buses running, right? Let's, as I said, go buy some some chargers from Amazon, get them on the wall, and uh, and start charging. The second thing we started to look at was what our maximum capacity would be in our depot without doing any electrical work or doing minimal work. Um, and it was helpful to have an engineer and one that understood electric buses kind of help think through that. That's a, it's not terribly complicated. It's a little bit complicated because at first brush, what people want to do is they want to charge all the buses at a peak time. And if you use any kind of software, you can stage that charging, which means you can put more buses on a certain load of power. And then we, um, and then we, we started, we're in the middle of, and we're working with uh, CalStart and WRI on a capacity analysis, looking at the, the number of buses that will fit in our depot uh, and the electric capacity that we need. And we're thinking through just a sort of a one-time approach, you know, dig once to install more power. Is that, is the, so I guess really the, the it's sort of, I think of it and I think of the, first of all, I guess maybe the two summary lessons are, it's helpful to get a professional, Remember that the charger companies and the dealers, they want to help you both because they're nice, but also because they want to sell you stuff. And that doesn't mean that they're bad, right? But there's, but you know, Joe, that there's, you know, you can walk into a hardware store and they want to sell you stuff, but they're still going to tell you the right tool to buy. Um, right. We all have great resources from, uh, from, from WRI and CalStart who can help us as well. 
Uh, so that's one lesson is sort of getting some help. And the second is kind of thinking of, of chunking it. You don't have to solve the big problem of how your, you know, your long route up in the hills of, you know, northwestern New Jersey is going to work first, right? You can you can solve some of the shorter routes first. And and then build towards sort of that that bigger plan and that bigger implementation. Thanks. Uh, Tim, did you want to add something? I think you put something in the chat. No, I was just sharing some information in the chat on our charging setup, but I want to reiterate that last point that Matt just made. Um, we have a tendency to focus on what these buses can't do, what their limitations are, uh, rather than what they're capable of. You know, we all have short routes, comment. mileage wise, right? Um, so yeah, pick that low hanging fruit. Thanks, uh, Kian, did you want to add anything? Uh, ask your senior union drivers, which ones are the easiest route and you can, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a great chance for labor management partnership. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'll just say, I mean, in Boston, we have routes that go up to 100, 120 miles and. Um, yeah, that's so we don't put the electrics on them yet, but we're getting we're getting there. Yeah, so I think, you know, like um, a number of people have mentioned um, and Philip indicated, you know, WRI has technical assistance hours. Um, so please, you know, reach out to them and get, you know, that really great expert um, advice you know, think, pull together your questions, you know, what you're looking for. Well, how big is your fleet? How, you know, how many are you willing to move to electrify, in, you know, in the next couple of years? What does your routes look like? Um, and then, you know, set up an appointment and talk through the process um, with them. So it's a great resource. Um, there, There's a link on the school bus page to WRI and their technical assistance and how you can register and sign up um, and schedule. Uh, like a 30 minute session. So please, please do that. Um, so I'm going to go to Joe, uh, who's yeah. been patiently waiting. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me on too. So um, I work for IVS. I'd mentioned in the chat, we're a uh, solution provider for buses, believe it or not. And we have like 5,000 buses in New York City already. But my job is New Jersey. So my question, I saw you wrote in the chat, New Jersey does not have vendors as part of the New Jersey school bus program. Can you? Uh, I'm an integrator. I'm a vendor. Right. So, you know, we partner with the school districts, the school bus um, contractors, and right. it's up to them to do their own procurement. We don't, we, okay. you know, we didn't do any kind of um, RFP to have authorized vendors. Um, you know, as part of the program, it's up to each district uh, and to go out they, and procure. They invite them. I got an email as an invite to this from okay. them. So that's good then. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Sure. Um, any other questions? I have 86 people on the call. Nobody has questions. Everybody's ready to jump in and uh, uh, submit an application. Oh, Jenny. Jenny, please unmute and you can go ahead and answer your question. OK, do you hear me? Yes. OK, great. I mean, I guess I was just curious if anyone, I'm not sure if any of the panelists, but uh, if anyone can speak to um, utility rates in New Jersey, whether or not they do offer off-peak rates for commercial entities, because I'm not aware of our utility doing that I, and whether or not that's in process, right? Um, so I, what I will say about that is, you know, I'm not, you know, sure of the specifics for each of the four utilities um, in New Jersey. We are in the process of putting up um, a document that was provided to us from the utilities on our website, and it will be under the resource um, resources page. Uh, but it's a one-page document with contacts to each of the utilities here in New Jersey. Um, so my advice would be to reach out directly to your utility um, and ask them that specific question. Thank you. I have also used Upplug WRI, um, like their office hours and their sort of free technical assistance to um, my utility has like their rate structure. I just Googled my utility's rate structure and was reading it and it, you know, it's like legalese and I 
jargon. I couldn't understand it. And I sat down with my with WRI and we sort of went through it and they explained it to me in, in plain language and it was so helpful. Thank you. Good to know. Uh, Tim? Uh, I was just going to add, I think I'm not uh, attuned to New Jersey's rate structures, but I do believe you guys are deregulated, um, which which means you can competitively shop for supply um, and then utilize if you have a power purchase agreement with someone where you're getting your supply, try and utilize their expertise, um, especially if you're using using some type of a brokerage firm. Um, they're going to know darn well when the cheapest time is going to be to charge. That's really helpful. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, Joe, I see you have another question. Yeah, quick one, quick one. Mm -hmm. All this is going to be on your website, like a repeat of this whole seminar, webinar? Yes. Yep. Okay. So we are recording this uh, two hour webinar and we will post it on the website. Great. And if you have Thank further you. questions, you could submit questions through our stop the soot um, email resource. And then we'll be answering those questions and we'll be posting the Q&A's uh, weekly. All right, I'll ask a few questions and hopefully that will spur some thought for um, our audience. So I'm going to go back to you, Tim. Um, do you have to think differently about your budgets or the timing when ordering electric school buses versus um, a diesel school bus? Uh, I think that's in the transportation directors, I think, and under, I mean, the last, you know, Matt can speak to it probably better, three years or so um, has caused a lot of supply chain disruption to uh, the industry as a whole. Um, the elect transition to electrification is has disrupted it further. So yeah, the further out you can plan, uh, the better. You know, there used to be a rhythm as to, you know, people had the, the timing down as to when their order would place, and then they would know that the bus would be delivered in time for school to start in the fall. And that's not necessarily the case. The secondary part of that, it's not just the bus, it's not just the charger, it's the infra infrastructure to support the charger. Um, so we have, I listed in the chat, we have four 60 kilowatt DC fast chargers here that are V to G, bi-directional uh, capable. Uh, we have seven level twos. Um, when we upgraded our, uh, our bus barn, our infrastructure last uh, summer, we ordered the supplies for that, the switch gear uh, and, and everything in February of 2023. Uh, we are still waiting on some some switch gear that we anticipate to be delivered this May. Uh, so two of our DC fast chargers and one of our level twos are not functional because we don't have the uh, internal capacity to support it. Um, to make sure that our fleet was electric so that we had uh, um, vehicles operational for all of our routes, uh, we had our electrician put in some temporary panels until we wait for that switch gear to come in so that we have chargers to support um, the buses and the routes that we run. Um, right now, I was talking with our trans, I was out in the bus barn this morning, and right now, all that means for us is right now, we've got a situation where uh, we've got a DC fast charger that we plug one bus into, and when that bus is full, we move the plug over to a second bus. Um, so from a timing standpoint, try and take all those things into, into consideration. Um, it, it might be simple in your, especially if you're just transitioning a few uh, electric buses to begin with, um, like Matt was talking about, you might be able to get a couple low level uh, chargers without very much infrastructure upgrade at all. And for the most part, the charging stations, um, you know, traditionally in the last 12, 18 months have been available. Um, I would encourage everyone that, A, I would encourage everyone to apply for EPA clean school bus rebate money. Uh, number two, I would encourage everyone to be ready Tim, to Tim, place there's more their competition. Order. What are you crazy? <laughs> no, it's very hard to apply. Sorry. You shouldn't. It's, it's, hey, I've already got my buses. <laughs> these things don't work. <laughs> you know what? Ah, the global warming isn't happening. You don't need to worry. About I'm, I'm kidding. I yeah, I know you. Are. The second thing I would do is I'd be prepared to place that order. This is one of the things that I'm proud of. I. 
Um, I think it's backed up by research from WRI too when they conducted their when they they got the data on the applications for last fall. I think we were the uh, first order placed after the awards were announced uh, because we had our quotes uh, and our bids and everything. We knew what we were going to order if we won, and when we won, we placed the order um, and got got in the queue uh, because it, there's good the queue is going to be. Um, longer this time because there were just uh, there was just a round of EPA grants awarded as well. So yeah, full answer. Plan well, be ready to order, uh, and apply for the funds. You know, is, would be my would be my response. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I had recently heard that um, the wait, you know, the lead time on a diesel bus is you know almost just as long as. Um, the electric school buses. And I've also heard that the cost of the diesel school buses are um, increasing. So, um, you know, the incremental difference between the electric bus and the diesel bus isn't that, you know, isn't that big anymore. Um, and I expect, you know, the price of electric school buses to keep decreasing. You know, there's a lot of funding nationwide and, you know, there's more interest. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll see those costs um, go down. All right, I don't, I still don't see any questions from the group. So I'm thinking we're going to have a very robust um, analysis of all these applications. Um, let me see, let me. No, wait, wait till um, the uh, February 6th uh, seminar. <laughs> yeah. That's when no, they'll all I come mean, in. <laughs> that's great. I mean, I, I welcome questions. I, you know, I think that's, you know, a great way for everybody to learn. Okay, Spencer, I see your hand up. So. so oh, hold on. Hi, guys. So I just wanted to touch base. There was a question by Thomas in the chat about cobalt mining. And um, speaking to Philip, I'm not an expert in the mining of cobalt, but I want people to know that there are options for batteries that don't include cobalt. Uh, I work for BYD Ride, and our batteries are lithium and iron, iron phosphate. They do not include iron or do not include cobalt. So I just want to make sure that people are aware that that's an option. It's considered the safest form of chemistry for batteries. So just want to make sure that the group is aware that there are options out there for a type of battery of that. All right. Thank you. You got it. Spencer, while you're here, I didn't realize you were here. Um, great to see you. Hi, Spencer. Could you talk about Thank the you. um? the the byd achiever is that, it's a type sure. c is that right so it does depend on the state and the specs but in okay. the state of new jersey it would ideally probably be a type b um based on the weight and the seats so yes it is an mm -hmm. option that i guess what i would have to get clarity from melissa in the group but it is our technically our type a we call it a type a but it, it depends on the state so in the state of new york it's listed as a type c um, so it's something a discussion and have to get clarification um, from Melissa and group as to what bucket it would fall under. Yeah, but good question. Thanks. Just like everything else, New Jersey laws are a little quirky, and especially it's when it comes to though. school buses. Every, <laughs> every state does yeah. their own thing, which is fine. We love to tell ourselves that in Massachusetts too. So, <laughs> well, good. We're not the only ones then. So thanks, uh, Joe. I just want to know, Melissa, are you hosting? The other two coming yes, up, D seminars D too? You're doing DUP all three? Will be host yeah, DUP will ho be hosting both of those. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so as part of our program, um, there is uh, maintenance and training that has to be provided. Um, so I wanted to know from any of our panelists, you know, was that part of the programs that you um, received funding for? Did you take out maintenance contracts? Was that something that you needed? I can, I'll jump in first. Um, Lion Electric is, has been very, I mean, they've extremely helpful. Um, they were here on site when our first buses were delivered. Um, our fleet manager slash transportation director slash mechanic and all the bus drivers were on site for a bus driver training. Uh, prior to that training, they have online modules that um, we had access to that we were able to walk our drivers through. And then when the bus got here, they were able to see everything live, ask questions, interact with our 
you know, our customer um, uh, service rep slash trainer. Um, that same day, uh, we also had our first responders in the area on site. So we could walk our first responders through some of their anxieties as they come across these vehicles in the wild. Um, and beyond that, we've had, uh, they, uh, they flew a, uh, a technician training uh, here for two days to train our, our mechanic slash transportation director and, and one of our drivers who also has a mechanic background uh, to be able to provide technical service to our fleet. Um, so we don't have to wait on a service technician to perform some of the smaller uh, modifications as they arise. A good example is uh, an issue that we experienced uh, was with a certain model of diesel auxiliary heater. Um, so our personnel were able to make some adjustments uh, to the to those heaters to make them operate well, you know, in the in the really cold weather. So all you know, that's just been my experience with um, our fleet and our OEM. Has anybody seen any um, or had any, you know, maintenance issues that would be, you know, ab above and beyond what you would see with your, you know, traditional diesel bus? Like, do you find that there's more um, time needed to operate these buses? You know, I'm Can just I trying to, pull, you know, pick uh, out yeah. any hurdles or things that people might be saying, well, I'm not well, going to do that because. <laughs> Yeah. I'll give you two real I can stories. Give it quick. One, of, one of them happened yesterday morning. I'm sorry, Kian. <laughs> yesterday morning, we had a driver hit. We've got one one really rough road. I'm sure that's true in all parts of the world. And we have a driver that likes to drive through a series of potholes rather than avoid them. And at a speed that is much faster than what he should. Um, so it tripped a crash sensor on the bus and it shut down the high voltage system. Uh, so luckily, Lion had trained our transportation director, our, our mechanic, to go go out, and he um, trouble he did some troubleshooting. It was just like a bathroom outlet, right? Um, he just clicked the the reset button, and and the bus was good to go. Uh, so sorry, Kian, that's that's just been one of the things we experienced. Yeah, no, no, no worries. I was. Um going to give maybe a quicker answer. I don't. I can give a sort of quicker answer from Boston standpoint. I. Um, I just so uh, so Boston, I should also say Boston owns its 750 school buses, but we have um, Transdev Incredible who is operating and maintaining those buses. Um, so there's just there's a there's a layer there, but I can speak a bit to um, the issues we've had in the past year with our electric buses or have not been so much the EV powertrain um, and when there has been anything with I think maybe once or twice there's been an EV powertrain, a small thing, and that the, our dealer, we don't have any formal like additional maintenance or, or service level agreement. Um, service level agreement is something else I would encourage folks to Google and look into. We do not have anything like that, but our dealer comes up and is very, very diligent about um, addressing warranty claims. And so he has taken the bus to um, the warranty shop, which is a mile up the road from us, um, I think once or twice. Um, I was interested to hear somebody just mentioned the heaters because we actually have had some issues with the the heaters have um, the back cabin heater, which ours is electric. It's not diesel fired, um, but we've had maybe four or five times now on different buses something happened there. Um, overall, though, good. I would say I don't, I don't want to like I, there have been challenges, but I do want to say from a maintenance standpoint, like we have not had some of the nightmares we thought we might have. Um, and our team has been able to those those smaller things, those non powertrain issues, you know, our maintenance team has been able to just tackle them as if it were a regular bus. Um, which has been has been key. Um, and we've got the way I see it is we've got about seven or eight years here until the warranty is up. And by then, then I need to figure out if we're maintaining this electric powertrain or or not or how that'll play. But we've got we've got an eight year warranty. Um, yeah, and I'll pause there and leave them. Thanks, Ken. I think, you know, in the early years, 19, you know, 2019, 20, you know, that was the, you know, the first round of electric school buses. Um, and so I think that, you know, there were things that went awry um, and not, you know, to plan. But um, since then, there's been, you know, a lot of advances and, you know, people are figuring out um, things as far as the buses and the charging stations. Um, 
So I, I think, you know, just because you heard a bad news story a couple years ago doesn't mean that's still where we are. Um, you know, like I said, I think there's bumps in the roads to everything. Um, you know, our panelists here, they, you know, are committed to keep applying for funding and getting more and more buses. Um, and so everybody has skin in the game and has to put some of their own dollars towards the program. So the fact that you're still moving forward, Tim, you're, you know, working throughout your state to try to, um, you know, transition to electric school buses is is a good testament that, you know, maybe there was bump in the road, you know, bumps in the roads and there's still things that you have to learn, but the cost savings is enormous. Um, you know, just the savings on fuel is way larger than I would have thought. So, um, so I think, you know, that's some good news. Uh, Tim, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I mean, I'd add that, you know, we all know that there, there are naysayers um, with regards to a transition to any type of technological change like this. And this, this is transformational. We've been using internal combustion engines for 100 years, you know, right? So this is a pretty significant change. Um, but when you look at it at its basic level, it's much more simple than what you think. Um, for those of the people on the call that are golfers, I mean, you you go to golf courses, the best golf carts are electric golf carts. If, you know, I go, I've got friends that I golf with that they love the electric golf carts. And while we're riding it, they um, complain about the transition to electric vehicles. That's not going to work. And then we'll go to a different golf course and it's an old gas go-kart engine and they're like this go-kart's terrible <laughs> like do, you know you're not connecting connecting the dots um with these type c electric school buses the design's very the software is complicated the wiring harness is complex vg is difficult but the motor is very very simple it's for lack of a better visual it's a big alternator most of the buses just have a short drive shaft to the rear axle and that's it you know, and then you have a pedal that tells it when to go. And when you pull off the pedal, um, it acts as an alternator to put charge back into your battery. Um, so that's I'm a big fan of the type C um, uh, buses right now. And, and the type D are pretty similar in. And that's because the design is extremely simple. I know the battery chemistry is going to uh, improve and evolve. I know the wiring harnesses in the software are going to get better and better every day. But the real core components of that bus in a decade, I don't think are going to be much different. Thanks. I see a question from Leanne. Yes, hi. Um, so I don't have, my buses aren't in a locked yard right now. And I guess one of the biggest questions I have is how big is the charging st uh, station? Like, could somebody just come up and steal it? Like, I know that during our football games, we have to move out all of the buses to make room so that cars can fit in for the stadium. You know, concern is how big, you know, is the charging station? Would that need to be moved as well? Which I feel like it's probably like a million pounds and not going easily to be, you know, moved. But could somebody come up and steal it? So, yeah, so um, the charging also, stations. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'll, I mean, I'll just say I think about security or we have sorry, um, our buses are also like sort of in an open yard and lot and, you know, on the weekends it is often closed, but oftentimes not. Um, the chargers, I think, are going to be mounted to the wall and you can't you couldn't quite rip that off. It, it will take up some space, though, and you I don't you could not move it like for a football game. Um, I would encourage maybe and like if size is a constraint or like encouraging just sharing that with the project planner at the beginning, because I think some models of chargers are going to be smaller than others. Um, and so just making just thinking about picking a smaller one at the beginning, I think would be a fine workaround. So um, like I'm just I, in a parking lot, like I'm in a random parking lot where like my yeah. my buses are. So I just don't see if you're saying like, you know, mount it to a wall. There is no wall like it, oh, okay. it wouldn't be practical. So we put pedestals, we put like a cement block and then like a metal pedestal coming up and the charger is bolted to that. You can't and then it's much bigger. You you cannot steal it. Um, I will also say we have we bump out every bus 10 feet to fit the charger. I'm hoping we're going to find smaller chargers. and It won't be a full 10 feet. But in Boston, I'm so tight on space. And so that's been a hard pill to swallow. I, I don't want to. I mean, my bus yard is full with all 750 buses. I don't know where I get this extra space. 
Um, um, Leanne, I could maybe even send a picture of the pedestal too to um, yeah, no, that would, try and communicate what that means. Now, I also have another question as far as like the mechanics, like it's hard enough. We don't have our own mechanics, so we have to drive 25, 30 minutes away to a mechanic. Um, you know, what kind of training is involved for them to learn and do they need um, special tools or machines to be able to, you know, look at the buses and things like that? Like, what are those extra charges? I can no. give you oh, oh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead, Matt. I was going to say that, um, I mean, I think it's it's two kinds of mechanic work. You know, you're going to be covered by a warranty for all of the electric bus stuff. So there won't, you know, we, we are the, the mechanics come to us to do the repairs there uh, for the um, for the the not, you know, the the brakes, the tires, the replacing windshield washers, the 12 volt system. Um, you need there. There are classes available. We are developing one here in New York that's going to be open for everybody on uh, high voltage awareness. Obviously, people want to be aware of high voltage systems, but our mechanics, you know, one of the challenges we were talking earlier about challenges, one of the challenges we had was just you know, mechanics that were, you know, scared to go near the bus, right? They needed some training and they needed to, uh, but but once we provided that training and showed them, um, they, they don't need special tools. Uh, there is a shut off so that if you're doing something else, you can shut off the high voltage. But but the basic thing we've experienced is any of the electric bus specific stuff is worked on by someone else who's come to us and that we are able to do. We've had very little non-electric bus um you know, sort of other systems that have had challenges, except for just sort of the basics around tires and things. Ken, do you want wow. me to show? I have a picture of your charging bollards from when I was visiting. Would it be useful to put that on the screen or not? Never mind. Yeah, if you have that, throw that up. I was just Googling too. Yeah, do it. How long does it take for your mechanic to come out? I mean, I know you're in New York, so like maybe you have it close by, but I feel like, I mean, are you um, waiting like weeks for a mechanic to come? We are not, you know, it, it will depend on where, so here you go. Um, so no, we're, I mean, it, it depends, right? It depends on which powertrain, but no, we're usually waiting, um, you know, depending on what's going on, you know, anywhere from one day, maybe a week sometimes. Are you able to see this? You all able to see this? Yes. Yes, yeah. So, and I can show you other, you know, the other way. Here's the, that's, you know. I don't. I don't know if anyone wants oh, me to yeah. go through these and narrate what you've got here. Yeah. So that's the, that big box there where it says that's the um, the transformer and switch gear are over there, and then the switch gear is to the left of it or to the right of it. But that also that green box I recently learned in order to make a wire turn, that's actually like complicated. And that whole green box, all we're doing, it's a turn. <laughs> and it's turning then onto this. That this the the sort of this line here runs to the green box. Leanne, I will also say that I know um, I've heard uh, that there are portable uh, lower voltage fast chargers that, um, you know, some of the dealers are testing out and that they look promising. And I think it is to address, um, you know, areas where the space is very tight. Um, yeah. And that picture I want to call out. Um, uh, Philip mentioned earlier in, the, in his presentation about above ground like running the wiring above ground instead of digging a trench and burying the wiring that in that picture you saw we have it's above ground for those first 20 buses we for a few different reasons we did that it was about the same cost as putting it underground so keep that in mind but if if you want to potentially move it like this is a great that little it's called a raceway but all the wires are in that little black box there um and so our next round, we're deploying another 20 this spring and we will be trenching. Um, but we want it from this first time when Boston was first rolling out its 20. Um, it's a way to kind of manage risk. Oh, that's smart. And save probably save installation time, I would guess. That was the other thing. And also, as you can see, we launched our first 20 buses launched in February 2023. This was before I got here. But and for those of you maybe on the East Coast or New England, you remember last year there was super mild winter one week. It was like negative 10 degrees. That was that was this week um, when they launched. But um, part of it was we can't dig in the winter in Boston when the ground is frozen. I can't trench. So this helped us like launch the project sooner. Um, 
another thing just to keep in mind. And yeah, you can't dig in the winter. I don't know how cold it gets in New Jersey, but. You can get cold. Um, so Leanne, my advice would be, you know, to reach out to the school, you know, uh, to your school bus provider to see if they offer an electric school bus and what their charging options are, you know, or reach out to the other school bus um, manufacturers here in New Jersey, um, you know, because they will know what chargers work well with their buses um, and they'll be able to tell you, you know, their experience with other, you know, chargers and, you know, what your options might be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joe? Melissa, where's the New Jersey DEP located? In Trenton. Oh, it's in Trenton too? Okay. Mm -hmm. Questions? Um, I'll say we also put like a, the little cement barrier so that when you're backing up the so that the tires hit that barrier of the bus so you can't back into the um the charger which we were terrified would happen <laughs> um so going to tim's point where he's talking about the electric golf carts and you know driving them um i was at a conference and there was actually a school bus driver who you know gave his testimony of how much he loves to drive an electric school bus now because it's quiet and you know the children um don't see him as precocious i guess because of the noise and all that and i was just wondering um you know in this time where there's it's really hard to get school bus drivers um you know is that something that helps have, do you have any experience of you know your school bus drivers um do they have any feedback? Do they like the buses? Do they not like the buses? Because it's very different than what they're <coughs> used to driving. Our our drivers all like the buses. Um, the transition that they have is is it's no different than transitioning from a Bluebird to a Thomas diesel bus. You know, all their switches and stuff are in a little bit of a different location. The seat's not cut quite molded to their butt yet. <laughs> you know, it's that type of just familiarity and comfort. But as far as the actual bus itself, um, two real interesting stories. As we started to deploy, I was at the bus barn every morning and night. And one night we started up our, we have a spare diesel bus that we use for practices and games. And our transportation director started it up to, to warm it up for our driver. And I had forgotten how loud they are because there's just no noise out there when our bus, our electric buses are plugged in and they're they're doing their, their battery conditioning, their preheating. Um, you have a little bit of diesel exhaust coming out when it's super cold and the cabin has to be heated, but it, the noise is very, uh, very, very uh, minute. Um, and then the other thing is just the comfortability of the ride. The, you know, we have some bumpy roads out here in, in our rural area um, and the, the uh, the weight distribution of the bus just seems a lot more even uh, that makes the, you know, if you, you remember on, the, on our traditional buses, if you sat in the back seat and you hit a bump, I mean, you could get some pretty good air. <laughs> I mean, these, bu these buses are, so they're quieter and they're smoother um, and, and the, the kids enjoy them too. Great. Uh, yeah, nice. anecdotally, we've heard good things from drivers. I mean, we there are. Yeah, it's it's a change, and I think there's a little bit of is is my butt molded to the seat yet? Those a lot of that's I think a great way to describe it. There's a lot of those, um, and I'll say in Boston we are, um, like I'm sure many of you, it's a highly unionized environment. Our drivers are mechanics. Everybody is, um, um, but and as part of that union for our drivers, based on seniority, they pick the bus route. And so they look at those routes and they know which, so there's 700 plus, but 20 of them are electric. And the electrics are chosen very early. I don't have exact numbers, but like the drivers are choosing the electrics soon. So it's a good story we think from, um, from an adoption standpoint. Thanks for the feedback. Um, I see a hand up for Thomas. Hello. Um, for the, uh, the charging system is that 220 440 it's three phase obviously but what, what's the amperage running to, the, to those units that you had to have the electric company come in and and 
put in? Is it 220? Is it 440? Um, What's the amplitude? Boston, we're 480 volt. Um, 480? Yeah. Um, that's our, 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 our 60s. Actually, I don't know. Our, so we have 60 kilowatt chargers and 30 kilowatt chargers. The 60s I have right in front of me is 480. Um, the 30 I don't, but. So yeah, we'll, we worked and with like, our utility and we're going to upgrade the power um, to full. Yeah. A lot of my questions seem like I'm, I'm anti-EV. That's not really the case, but to, to Tim's point, I mean, I've driven these buses. They are just quiet. And some drivers, that's a good thing. Some drivers, it's a bad thing because now all they hear is the kids. <laughs> um, but that's actually a better thing, in, in my opinion, because I want to hear what's going on behind me. Um, I've had a driver who overheard a student um, talking about suicide, and that driver probably saved that student's life uh, because the driver reported it to the school administrator, uh, superintendent got involved, and you know there was intervention. So it's it's really a much better thing that that drivers can hear what's going on in the bus. You know we have cameras, we have audio, but nothing overrides what you're actually hearing. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, any more questions? I can keep asking questions, but, um, you know, if we're not getting questions from the audience, I don't want to keep anybody longer than, you know, they want to be here. So um, can I throw in a closing comment, Melissa? Sure, absolutely. This is something I picked up from from Boston at a, at a different event when we were um, they, have, they have a team. I um, mean, and I don't even know if maybe maybe Kean was there, but it was about indoor air uh, quality in, in D.C. Uh, earlier this fall. And one of the Boston uh, team members said, don't let perfect get in way, get in the way of the good, you know, um, and that's I'm guilty of that. You know, I want everything to be perfect. You want to plan it out. So there's no uh, don't let that get in the way of what's of what's good. Um, and really, you can start by just transitioning a few vehicles on your shortest routes and and kind of get your dose, your toes dipped in the water a little bit there. Can I echo? So, I think, hey, as a Yankee fan, thank you, Boston. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll say I know I did not say that, but I know who did say that. I think I know who did say that. Um, our Jackie Hayes, who has been promoted, she now runs the entire Department of Transportation here in Boston. She like did our 20 pilot our pilot of 20 buses, but she, I actually had a similar closing thought. Um, she had a great saying about like taking bites. We're eating a sandwich here and you got, we're looking at taking the next biggest bite that we can, but we don't have to eat the whole, you don't have to take, we don't have to eat it all. Um, and so I often am, have a huge fear of the unknown. And so one, I've been trying to be very explicit about, you know, this is a factor that will affect this immediate next bite, this next decision. And what is something we can kind of just put it in the, parking lot, the figurative parking lot, and come back to it. And maybe this matters when we're at 50, 60, 70% of the fleet is electric. But right now where I'm looking at 5%, 10% of the fleet being electric, I don't need to worry about that yet. And so setting right. that aside for just Good focus point. on the bite in front of you, what you can take. Thank thanks. you again. Yeah, thanks, Ken. You know, I think that's important. And that's, you know, our electric school bus law is a pilot program. You know, for us to figure out what works, what doesn't work, what technologies can be integrated um, and to give, you know, the incremental difference between, you know, an electric bus and a diesel. So, you know, there's not too much hardship on the districts who are transitioning. Right. It, it's, you know, very similar to from a cost perspective of, you know, moving forward with a diesel uh, bus. Um, so that's exactly what this is. It's a pilot program at where we're, um, you know, hoping to have people experience this um, and learn about it. And, you know, again, making, you know, the air quality is much cleaner for the drivers, uh, for the you know, residents that the buses go through and, you know, especially for the children. Um, so I will, you know, Philip, do you have any last thoughts? And I, uh, Matt, if you have any last thoughts, please share them. And yeah, I just uh, I just dropped the link again for our brief five question survey. Again, that helps us just know if we're hitting the mark on these types of presentations and technical assistance. So if you can just give us, you know, two, three minutes of your time to fill that out, we greatly appreciate it. 
Um, and otherwise, just, you know, the, Ian, Matt, Tim, th these folks are doing amazing work and really, you know, lead on the leading edge here of what um, of what we need to, to make electric school buses possible. I answered as many questions in the chat as I could. So a lot of concerns about, you know, costs, the economy, fuel, I mean, all sorts of different things. And, you know, as our panelists have said, like, would it be really hard to have 100% electric school buses right now today? Absolutely. But you can start with two. You can start with five. Matt's getting 100. Kian is, is I think, getting 70 or 80 in addition to the 20 they have. Tim is working with 20 districts to do microgrids to help their electric school buses with solar. There are a lot of folks doing really awesome work and like leading the way here. So where these funding programs are open, that that is, you know, not every district, not every state has a funding program like this. Not every district is able to access this type of this type of support. So again, you know, take the money while it's there and, and get started on, on this transition because it's only going to pay dividends in the future when these prices do come down, when the chargers are cheaper, when the range is enough to meet all of your needs, when all the all the other places you need to take your bus do have charging infrastructure. That's all starting to happen. It's all happening at the same time. So that, you know, it's hard when like you're getting more EVs and more chargers and it's all kind of happening simultaneously, but the, we're seeing the market grow rapidly across the country. And so again, I just really um, want to thank them for joining us and thank you all for joining us to learn more. And, and you know, obviously I'm in the, I'm, you know, I'm on the side of electric school buses. It's, it's my job description, but uh, I just, you know, when you when you think about the health benefits for students, especially those with asthma, especially those who already face a disproportionate exposure to air pollution in their communities, uh, I, I think it's the right choice. And so, you know, our website, electricschoolbusinitiative.org, have a lot of resources. We have office hours uh, and we're happy to help. So please reach out. We really want to connect with as many of you as we can. And thank you, Melissa, and thank you, DEP, for, for having this and for getting this funding program going. Uh, we're excited to see how it rolls out. Yeah, thank you, uh, Philip. I see, Thomas, you have your hands up. Yeah, the, the one question I asked in the chat, the, what is the, the GVWR of, of an electric bus compared to a diesel? Like, I have two, two of my 54 passengers are 26,000 pounds. If there are 26,001, you need a Class B CDL, but my Class C drivers can still drive them. But I'm not sure that's going to be available on an EV bus. They'll probably be yeah. All so our EV. electric type Cs are up at 33,000. Um, I'll say also from a licensing standpoint, we do not have air brakes, and N we're not going to I. add an air brake. Some electric bus I, manufacturers I are but, pushing air brakes, and we I mean, will I not. I have a Class A license, but um, yeah, for for yeah, the yeah, thousand so drivers, we're not going to add. So. Fine then. Okay. Um. Matt, I just want to give you an opportunity if there was something you wanted to say in closing. I mean, you know, whatever, all, everything is said, but I, just, I do want to reiterate that I'm really very happy to have anyone come visit and, you know, kick the tires um, if you want. And look, we can do this. We are doing it. We're happy to share. They're great people that will help you. This is important for us to do to help help kids and, you know, help the blind. Thank you so much. And the stimulus um, help your school budget. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate um, all of our panel members. I know Tim had to jump off, but thank you, Matt, um, Kian, and Phil for joining us today, uh, for providing you know all your expertise and your insights on your projects. Um, I think it's very helpful, and hopefully um, everybody who joined the webinar today will have learned something or maybe help get them to that next step in thinking about transitioning to electric vehicles. Um, like I said, this webinar, we will post it on our website. We will go through the transcription and pull out all the questions and the answers and we'll assemble it um, and get it onto the web page for those uh, people who want to just peruse through the questions or may not want to listen to the whole two hours again to find out what the answer was to that question that happened somewhere midpoint. Um, so again, thank you very much to everybody who joins, I think at the highest point, I saw 107 participants. So I'm really excited. Again, anybody who has questions, please send them in to our Stop the Soot um, email and we will get to them um, and answer them and provide you information. So thank you again to our thank panel you. and uh, thank you to everybody who joined. Thanks everybody. Thanks.